Well, it's a little past four o'clock. I'd like to get started. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'd like to welcome you to the first set of lectures of this year's Ciencia Lecture Series. Uh, I'm Rick Wilson, the director of Ciencia. Uh, this program this year is the culmination of hard work carried out by members of Ciencia over the past year. We were ably led by Susan McIntosh, who was director of Ciencia for many years and uh, step, decided to step down last January. Uh, Fred Oswald served in the interim as uh, director until I returned from sabbatical and I took over, I guess, uh, July 1. So I would like to thank them for their service and also the members of Ciencia. And finally, of course, I'm gonna thank the audience. Uh, the topic this year focuses on inequality. And for any of you who stayed up a little last night watching debates, you realize that inequality is a complex issue that's currently on the front pages of uh, many of the newspapers we read. It's, uh, it's an issue that touches on differences between groups across social, economic, political, cultural, technological, and pedagogical dimensions. So it, uh, it calls on the full corpus of, of, uh, uh, the, of the faculty here at Rice and the students. Uh, and drawing on their own experience, uh, particularly in research uh, and their own personal experiences, uh, Rice faculty and members of the Houston community this year are going to turn to addressing the issue of inequality in different dimensions. We're lucky today to have a tag team of uh, two individuals who are going to present relatively short lectures, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, they're gonna do it in a tag team fashion. I'll serve as kind of a semi-moderator. I think I'll just be a timekeeper at best. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, I may cut the questioning off a little bit to get us to move out to where there's refreshments that will be served where you can continue discussions with the speakers and with one another. Our first speaker, and I'm gonna introduce them one at a time as they begin their, uh, just before their lectures. Our first is Erin Keck, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology here at Rice. Uh, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Clayman Institute for Gender Research at Stanford University. She earned her PhD in sociology in 2011 from UCSD and has a uh, Bachelor of Science degrees in electrical engineering and sociology from Montana State University. Her lecture is going to be on the passion principle, career choice and occupational equality, as you'll see there. So please join me in welcoming Erin, and, and I look forward to your talk. All right, everybody hear me okay? Welcome, thank you for coming. Um, last name is, is Zach, Some, sometimes that's, that's a struggle, but uh, no, no judgments there. Um, I'm gonna talk about the passion principle today. See if I can make this work. Oh, that was a total failure, let me try. <laughs> Okay. Yes, fabulous. The illustrious Steve Jobs is uh, accredited with saying the following. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know it when you find it. Raise your hand if you have said this to somebody, thought it of yourself, told a student this at some point in your life. Raise your hand. I'm raising my hand too because I think this about my own career. That's not something that should surprise any of you for somebody who is in academia and somebody who is a faculty member at Rice University. What I wanna talk about today is this idea that, that what you love is the most important thing in what you should do. And I call this the passion principle. And this is the idea, this is a cultural schema or sort of shared cultural model that elevates self-expression in the form of an intellectual, emotional, and or personal connection to one's work as the singular or central guiding principle in what one is supposed to do when they make a career decision. In other words, it is the central definition of what good work means and what we do when we have good work. What I want to argue today though, is that while the passion principle is generally beneficial at the individual level, it's good uh, psychologically, it's good for individuals when they enter the labor force, it can be potentially problematic in the aggregate. 
I'll explain first what I mean by this passion principle by drawing on interviews with 100 college students at three universities, as well as nationally representative data on workers in the US. And then I'm going to point to some of the possible ways that the passion principle might actually help to reproduce inequality in the aggregate. Things like reinforcing occupational sex segregation or questioning the moral legitimacy of using college as a tool for social and economic mobility. Let me first lay a little bit of theoretical groundwork before we get started in, on this idea of the passion principle. There exists an inherent uh, tension in post-industrial societies like the U.S. between the demands of the capitalist labor market and the dominant U.S. cultural expectation for self-expression. On the one hand, we have capitalism that needs more or less dedicated, obedient workers who more or less go along with what they're expected to do by their employers. From a sociological sort of Marxist perspective, we think that working in a capitalist labor force is sort of antithetical to self-expression. To sell one's labor on the labor market is sort of self-estranging by definition. Neo-Marxists thought about this in terms of blue-collar workers, people who work in uh, factories. Uh, people like Arlie Hochschild have extended this idea to include service workers who, uh, uh, who feel estranged from their emotional labor. So think uh, flight attendants who have to smile and be nice even when they're not feeling particularly nice or might be annoyed with their passengers. Uh, C. Wright Mills and others have theorized that white collar workers experience their own sort of alienation even though they are in the white collar sector. So we have this idea of selling one's labor and how it can be potentially alienating and that is in contrast to the prominence of self-expression in the United States. Post-World War II, the individual is the master human identity rather than one's religious group or gender or class. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is by uh, uh, Bella and colleagues who wrote, we believe in the dignity, indeed the sacredness of the individual. Anything that would violate our right to think for ourselves, make our own decisions, live our lives as we see fit is not only morally wrong, it is sacrilegious. The expression of our personal traits and preferences is how we perform individualism. The expression of this individualism is a central feature of post-industrial late capitalist societies, due in part to the existential security provided to most within, within uh, post-industrial societies, and also due to this idea of the reflexive project of the self. And by that I mean the idea that the self is something that we work on, that we think about, we reflect upon, we try and refine our sense of self. So we have this tension between the cultural demands of self-expression in the U.S. and the structural demands for workers who, more or less, need to do what their employers tell them to do. It is this tension that I'm particularly interested in when thinking about how young adults understand their place in the labor market. Specifically, how do college-age students conceptualize what good work means? Uh, and what cultural frameworks do they use to think about these kinds of issues? And I'm not just looking at college students because I'm around them all the time or because they're interesting, uh, but because they also are uh, at a useful place in the labor market that has the most flexibility in terms of the ability to change one's mind and also the time to think about what one wants from one's career. So in this presentation I want to talk about this idea of the passion principle as a widely held cultural belief by drawing on the interviews I'll talk about uh, with college students and then I'll explain uh, what this passion principle means and then discuss some of the broader implications, perhaps negative implications, of this idea of the passion principle. To give you a sense again of how salient the passion principle is, uh, this is a jacket from a uh, uh, room key that I I had about a week and a half ago in Washington, D.C., and even the, the jacket of the room key is imploring me to be myself. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a pretty darn prominent uh, cultural schema. 
what I was interested in with my, my study was to understand how college-going young adult, adults, often uh, uh, folks very similar to the people in this audience, were thinking about their lab the labor market and their place within it. And I'm, think I'm seeking out these cultural models that they're using for uh, trying to decide how they're supposed to go about making decisions in that labor market. In, this, uh, in, in my study that I'll, I'll talk about most specifically here, I use in-depth interviews with 100 college students across three universities, Stanford University, University of Houston, and Montana State University. And these are three universities that vary uh, along a spectrum of uh, how competitive they are, how, uh, where they are uh, located geographically, uh, public, private institutions, things like that. Uh, I have 56 women and 44 men in my sample, and my sample overrepresents students of color. So I asked them, what are good reasons for making a career decision? And good reasons for selecting a, a college major. And I asked them also, how did you go about choosing your major? And, how, and what factors are you considering when you're going to leave the, the, the confines of college and go to find a job? And what I found is that the passion principle is the central guiding principle for how students conceptualize what it means to have a good job. Passion, in other words, is a prerequisite for career decision making. This passion principle has three inter, uh, interrelated components. The first is an intellectual connection. Students said that you had to find the subject fascinating or interesting or intriguing or curious. There is an emotional connection to the work, a sense that one should love or find joy in their work, uh, that it should excite one. Uh, the third component is a personal connection, a sort of biographical connection to the work, a fit or match with one's unique sense of personhood. So to give you a flavor for what this sounded like when students articulated them, uh, I'll first read a quote from a business major at Montana State University. He said, you want to be happy, like everyone says. You just want to pick a job that will make you happy, like doing what you love. And I think you should take as many classes as you can to find out what you do love, kind of like dating. An anthropology major at UH said, choose a career field because you love it. And she laughs. That's the short and long of it. And I think that some people have this different idea in their heads, and that's probably because they haven't found what they love. They haven't found their passion. And that's very sad to me. To give you a sense of how prominent the passion principle was among students, I will show you this graph, and I realize it is quite uh, small uh, type at the very top, so I apologize. But what I did is I looked at the proportion of students who gave passion-related reasons as the most important reason for choosing a career path. And I broke it down by, uh, by different demographic categories. So here is women and men. This is Stanford, MSU, and UH. Uh, underrepresented under, under racial and ethnic minorities and white students, and lower, middle, and upper uh, socioeconomic status groups. And there is some variation here. And we can talk about that in the Q&A if anybody's interested. And, but what I want to point out is the, that largely around 70% of each group gave passion-related reasons as a most important uh, guiding principle in career decision making. This was in stark contrast to financial considerations and employment opportunities. Again, some interesting variation here that we can talk about later, but overwhelmingly, passion is the central principle that people are using. In fact, most students, or more students, openly rejected the use of monetary and employment considerations in the choice of a career path than those who actually said that they were a good idea. So many students told me that uh, using financial considerations as their guiding principle was bad because choosing a field for money reasons doesn't promote opportunities for self-expression. And students warned me that making a choice based upon money would lead to a miserable life or uh, money doesn't buy happiness. 61% uh, told me that money was a bad reason to make a career choice. To give you a flavor for this, this is a, a Stanford student, uh, an economics major. He said, I think money is not a good reason to pursue a career. Again, Stanford econ major, right? <laughs> you might find yourself questioning your existence and don't know yourself later in life. And really, I'd like to be able to go home every day and know I did something that I enjoy that benefits someone, hopefully. I think money is kind of a really bad reason to pursue a career. 
Like choices based upon money, careers chosen for, chosen for employment opportunities were seen as problematic because they similarly don't foster opportunities for personal success or for, for personal uh, uh, fulfillment. So. Uh, Students said there's no guarantee of finding a job, even if there are a lot of jobs out there, uh, or the well of jobs might suddenly dry up. Now, I want to point your attention to something interesting, and that is that, these, that this idea of money and job security being a problematic, morally, morally questionable way of making a career decision butts up against the idea that we can use college as a tool for social and economic mobility. The use of, uh, of, of uh, the career decisions based on money and job security for social, mo for social mobility is something that we often tout as a benefit of, uh, of this sort of, um, of, going, of being able to go to college. But there was a sense that this was, this was problematic. So for example, one student said, uh, articulated his distaste with students who seek money, uh, seek money for economic mobility reasons. He said, if students came from a very poor background, then maybe there's this hunger to go for a major that will yield the big bucks. But in the process, you're kind of exhausting yourself to death. What's the whole point? School is supposed to be enjoyable. All right, so that's their dominant guiding principles for thinking about what it means to make a good career decision. But do students really take the passion principle into account when making their own choice about their major and thinking about their own careers? We might expect them to be a little bit more instrumental. In fact, these students were in high school during the Great Recession, likely saw their parents or the, the friends of their parents losing jobs, losing homes, the, uh, what have you. But we see very similar patterns in the way that students articulated why they chose the major that they chose and in the factors they are considering when making a career choice after graduation. Why is this passion principle so compelling to students? Even though it might not help them to be financially stable when they, are, uh, when, when they, leave, when they leave college. Students not only articulated uh, the passion principle, something important because it would allow for self-expression, but because they connected passion with success. Students believe that having passion for a field meant that someone would inevitably work harder, put in long hours, than somebody who was motivated by money. But mo more saliently, Passion is so important to students because it was not only a sign of something that was a good job, but as key to a good life. Students expressed deep anxiety over what awaits them in the labor force and articulated in clear and often poignant terms their fears of being stuck in a job that they hate. An MSU engineering student said, I guess the short answer is I get one life on this planet. And so far, most of it's been spent in classrooms preparing me for a job. I'm going to go to work to this cubicle or some meeting or boardroom or production floor. I'm going to go there for the rest of my life. And then maybe if I've been careful and lucky, I'll be able to retire for the last four years of my life with bad hips and a bad heart and no hearing before I die. <laughs> I mean, that's life. And if I'm going to play that game, I at least want something that isn't too dreadful for the next 50 years. Choosing a self-expressive occupation is understood as highly rational to students because it is seen as the only guiding principle for career decision making that promises to insulate them from the alienation they believe plagues workers in the labor market. A UH music major said, being happy is the most important factor in choosing a career. Waking up in the day and doing exactly what you want. Maybe not exactly all day long, but I'm not going to spend eight hours miserable having to rely on gaming and alcohol. You should be happy at your job. We only live on earth so long. Why on earth would you have a job that you're not happy at? Is this passion principle something that is just focused on this uh, group of millennial students? Or is this something that we see in the population overall? The multi-million dollar enterprise of advice books and workshops and career counselors and life coaches aimed at opening up space in one's work for self-expression might suggest that this isn't just a millennial generation phenomenon. 
To illustrate this with uh, nationally representative data, I'll show you uh, this bar graph. So what I have here is a bar graph that represents uh, respondents who have college degrees in the darker purple and those who have high school degrees uh, or less in the, in the lighter purple. And I looked at a set of questions from this data that asks respondents how important are the following in deciding whether you would take a new job. And I looked at questions about meaningful work, whether the job was well paid, and whether they had job security. And unsurprisingly, those who had high school degrees or less found uh, uh, it, the income and job security more important than they found uh, having meaningful work. But for those with college degrees, having meaningful work was the most important thing to them when deciding to take a new job, more important than it being well paid or it having job security. But it's not that people who have high school degrees or less don't care about meaningful work. In fact, there's no statistical difference by education level nor by age, suggesting that this isn't a kind of uh, millennial phenomenon. So what does this have to do with inequality? So at the, uh, like as, I was, as I was saying at the beginning, social psychological research has demonstrated that at the individual level, uh, this self-expression is important it's useful, it's beneficial to people. I like my job a lot. I'm very passionate about my job, which makes doing this research actually kind of awkward sometimes. Uh, <laughs> that's for another conversation. Um, but what this research suggests, and some of the other work I've done, is that the passion principle might actually help to reproduce inequality in the aggregate. Students who, oops, wrong, uh, students who uh, have the opportunity to go to college are in a profoundly privileged position. But not all college students have the economic and social resources to succeed in their passion, nor to be able to parlay their passion into gainful employment. Many middle class students have the social and economic safety nets, like parents who allow them to sleep on their couches for a couple of months, if their passion doesn't pay the bills right away. Many lower class students and first generation students do not have such safety nets. Thus, it's important to think about how the passion principle might help to perpetuate existing inequality among students and how it might justify this inequality as simply patterns of individual choice. These results suggest a number of ways that the passion principle serves to reproduce trends in labor market inequality. First, the passion principle appears to challenge the moral legitimacy of using college as a tool for economic and social mobility. So for example, a low income University of Houston student I interviewed talked about the challenge he had assigning between accounting and political science. He originally chose accounting uh, because he thought it would provide financial security to him and his mother who couldn't work. But he felt pressured by his peers and his professors and his own adherence to the passion principle to switch to political science, his passion, even though he had no idea how he might go about finding employment in, in uh, political science. This rejection of money and employment considerations as legitimate factors for career choice may direct first generation and low income students away from choosing careers that would pr pr provide the opportunity to advance their socioeconomic status and ultimately help to perpetuate class differences among students after they leave college. Secondly, according to the passion principle, passion is enough for success. Everyone can follow their passion if they only work hard enough. The passion principle asserts that if a student has passion for a subject, that passion will provide the necessary intrinsic motivation to invest the hard work and long hours and grit and dedication needed for success. But we know that passion is not enough for success. Not all students possess the cultural and educational resources needed to succeed in a given field. For example, many more students articulate a passion to go to medical school then have the uh, academic preparedness and cultural capital to be able to succeed. The passion principle thus individualizes a lack of success among students as students own failings in their pursuit of their passion. Third, students' perspectives on the, on the career choices contains a critique of the labor force. We, we saw that in the kind of anxiety that students articulated in going into the labor, for, into the labor force. But the passion principle quells these critiques, uh, leading them, uh, silencing questions about whether or not uh, long work hours, expectations for overwork, and lack of leisure time is actually something that's beneficial. 
I'm going to skip over this one in the interest of time. So to conclude uh, this conversation about the passion principle, which I hope will uh, evolve into a broader conversation uh, among us all, I want to draw out a couple of implications from this project. On the one hand, at the individual level, as I said, self-expression is beneficial, but it can provide a range of problematic outcomes in the aggregate. These self-expressive processes of inequality are particularly difficult to address with policy actions and social change because self-expression is so valued and because the passion principle is such a dominant cultural schema in our society. We as Americans are strongly resistant to having our self-expressive freedoms taken away, right? This uh, means that the only viable solutions to these forms of inequality are the ones that avoid putting and, and the ones that avoid putting blame on members of disadvantaged groups to change their self-conceptions or change their self-expression are those solutions that address the structural and cultural environments in which such self-expressive decisions are made. Ultimately, this work draws attention to the way that seemingly positive and benign cultural processes can reproduce unequal social structures. And as a result, something so seemingly agentic and quintessentially American as self-expression and passion can end up reproducing an unequal status quo. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Elaine Howard Eklund, who's the Herbert S. Autry Professor of Sociology, and she is also director of the Religion and Public Life Program at uh, Rice University. Um, Elaine is the author of several books, two at uh, Oxford University Press and a forthcoming book from NYU Press, uh, all three of which are quite interesting. The current one is called Beyond the Ideal Scientist. Uh, Elaine has new, brought in numerous grants and awards from uh, places like the National Science Foundation, Russell Sage Foundation, John Templeton Foundation, etc. Uh, um, I'm looking forward to hearing her lecture entitled Beyond the Ideal Scientist, Why Academic Science Doesn't Work for Men or Women Who Want Children and Why It Matters. Elaine. <clears throat> Fun starts, right? Let's see if we can get it going. All right, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a great privilege uh, to be a member of Scientia and also to be invited to speak to my colleagues. It's always a great privilege to share one's research with her colleagues, so thank you for coming. Um, this research project that I'm going to share just a small snippet of today, so if this whets your appetite, I'll leave behind some references um, to the broader work that our team is doing around this area. Um, start is out in a really kind of fun way as being about one thing and turned out to be about something altogether different. Um, we started out just trying to examine, when I say we, I want to acknowledge my co-author on this grant, Ann Lincoln of Southern Methodist University. We started out trying to understand how both men and women view the inequality of women in science. So that was what we talked about in our study initially. And we started, we had the amazing brainchild of an idea that we were going to study men too, not just women. We thought men too might have something to say about inequality among women in science and apparently no one else had thought why study men. So we did and we got a grant to get going on this research. But what happened along the way uh, really confounded us and set the project in a whole different direction. Men started to talk about family life as well, particularly young women, young men rather, and about their own struggles with family life and the tension with scientific work. And that changed the project in a different direction. We still studied gender discrimination in science and inequality, but we also turned our lens on family life more broadly and the kind of structural inequality that people feel who have both um, children and a very active scientific career. Let me start by telling you the story of two individuals. Jennifer is a 25-year-old physics student, and she told us that she fell in love with science while in high school when she read Cosmos by Carl Sagan. 
She spent years pursuing her academic studies, and she's doing well in her graduate program. Yet she's questioning her future in academic science, how well she can fit in, her ability to succeed, whether she'll be able to have a family and be a successful scientist, whether she has what it takes to be good at the career she thought she wanted. She said to us, the main discrimination in the sciences I see is the idea that there is an ideal scientist. There's one particular type of person who does science. They like to work 14-hour days, and they think in a particular way, and their one and only passion, I think my work ties nicely and is informed by Aaron's, maybe even more than I know, is doing research. I'm not that person, and I wonder if that means I'll never be a good scientist. Also meet Arthur, who we write about in our book. Arthur's a professor in his early 70s who leads a bustling physics laboratory where he started as a postdoctoral fellow years ago. Still bearing a felt board office directory that looks straight out of the 1970s, Arthur's lab building harkens back to a different time, and in many ways Arthur does too. He describes himself as arrogantly confident. When asked, I'm going to start describing myself that way, arrogantly confident. When asked how, that's, no, that's not, that's not my style. When asked how he balanced work responsibilities with being a father to his two now grown sons, he explains that over the course of his 50 year marriage, his wife did everything and I did physics and she did the rest. As we listen to the interview again, it doesn't actually strike us that Arthur means this to be sexist. He says it in a way that communicates genuine appreciation for the way his wife managed and cared for their household in a way that allowed him to pursue the high calling of science. He goes on to say that if you need to be a scientist, it's very helpful to have a very powerful woman. She was a CEO, a secretary, and you wouldn't believe it, she ran the company, meaning his household. The boss, meaning himself, only signed things, and she keeps doing this still today. So who is this ideal scientist? When we ask scientists themselves in our study to remark on the ideal scientist, they said things that were enlightening to us. Science is a lifestyle of passion and a core component of one's identity. They see scientific work as a calling and devotes himself to it, and I mean that very intentionally. Women don't seem to fit in either men or women's conception of the ideal scientist. He puts work ahead of his family and personal matters, sees long hours as a badge of courage. Men and women indeed at elite research universities that we study, and I'll tell you a little bit more in detail about this study in a few moments, work upward of 55 hours a week, which is more hours on average than most other professions. But why is it the ideal scientist tenable? Science has become incredibly complicated as a structure. Getting a tenure track faculty position takes longer than ever before, Often, on average, even five years out post-PhD, many scientists do not yet have a full-time position at a university. For many, um, given that graduate degrees take longer, postdoctoral fellows are often two and three, delaying childbirth and child rearing is not possible or even desirable if someone wants to have children. Scientific life itself is more fractured as well. It's hard to see it as a calling when there is such a varied, varied set of really multiple set of activities. There's teaching, research, and service, which don't surprise us, of course, but there's also managing multi-million dollar grants. There is, there is retaining full-time lab employees who start to feel, in some sense, as scientists told us, like family members that the scientist PI is responsible for. There is a complicated relationship to industry and navigating that and what that means. There is also the complicated relationship to society and the increasing not just pressure but requirement by government funded AIDS funding agencies such as the NSF and the NIH to do very real outreach um, to members of society with some scientific work. The heavy demands of a career as an academic scientist impinge on family time and scientists increasingly say that they want more time with their family. But what struck us as being fascinating that this is not only true for women but it's also true for men. Young men in science today, we're finding, are more like Jennifer than Arthur. So we asked these two questions in this study, and again, I hope this whets your appetite for more discussion and more reading later on. I should say that Erin has written widely in this area as well, so I want to point you to her work too. So the first question, how do scientists, both men and women, experience balancing or the tensions between family responsibilities and work? How does family life relate to life satisfaction as well as career satisfaction for both men and women in science? 
I want to pause for a moment and give you a definition of family as the scientists themselves understand it. They generally, when they were talking about family life, were talking about a man and a woman raising children, but that was not always the case. And of course, we know that there's multiple ways of having family. And the diversity of family forms in our study actually led to a kind of commentary on the structure of science itself. It was a gay man in our study raising a child with his partner who told me when I interviewed him that um, I ought to look at the women who were PIs of laboratories and how many women wanted to work with them, that they were kind of a magnet for women in science, and that that put them in a very difficult situation because women often, their women students often wanted to take time off from research to initiate families, and that kind of compromised these young academic science women who were trying to really get their feet under them being PIs. And I felt like he noticed that because he felt he was marginalized in the scientific structure, it was easier for him to notice marginalized others. The ideal scientist's vision, we argue in our book, also has consequences for science. It reproduces gender inequality, and I want you to listen carefully for how that might happen. It strains families and children. It makes academic science an unattractive career choice for the best and the brightest. And sometimes people who want to have children might make excellent scientists. We shouldn't assume that being a scientist has to mean foregoing other life pursuits. We might even consider the ways in which those life pursuits might actually enrich the very nature of research itself. Family life is important for both men and women. So these kinds of inequality issues do hurt women more than men. I wouldn't want to wash that aside or in any way minimize that. Women leave science at higher rates than men. There's no question about that. Mothers pay a higher price than fathers. They're 27% likely in our study to receive tenure than men with children. 13% less likely than married women without children. But men also feel work and family tensions. It was interesting to us that 25% of men across ranks, um, across both of the disciplines that we studied, say that they had fewer children than they wanted as a result of the scientific career. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Here's some of the gaps that our study addresses. Um, the research has an overfocus, I think, on women's experience, and their, women's experiences need to be put into the context of the scientific structure as a whole to understand inequality in a more sensitive way, and in a way I think that will be more effective to lead to better policy. There's very little study of disciplinary differences. There is some work on the horizon. There's little comparison across career track. So how do graduate students compare to postdoctoral fellows, to assistant professors, and we could go on. There's also little study in general of perceptions of work-family balance, and little study of perceptions of discrimination. So in brief, our research um, does the following. So we surveyed uh, 3,455 scientists in two disciplines, in biology and physics, we chose those two disciplines because they're very core scientific disciplines, of course. Biology has had an increase over time in the proportion of women. Physics has remained fairly stagnant um, and has really struggled to draw women into the discipline in the same proportion as men, although there are vast differences we found among subfields in both biology and physics. And um, our study and other research that I'm working on is able to point that out nicely. We looked at scientists at top US universities. We looked at the top universities because we wanted to look at leader institutions and how they are handling issues of gender in science initially as part of the study. And our study lasted from 2007 to 2011. As I alluded to earlier, we looked at all career stages, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, assistant associate, and full professors. Our survey had a final response rate of 72%, which is a very high response rate in modern day survey research. And then we took another sample, a random sample of those who completed the survey, and we did in-depth interviews where we actually went out to their offices and laboratories and talked to them in great depth about these issues. And that really changed the way that we thought about the concepts under study in the survey in very helpful ways. And I'll share both of that with you in brief. First, I want to touch on gender similarities and differences. Um, between men and women. So here is just an overview of the proportion of men and women in top 20 US PhD departments. Um, you'll see that in physics, um, very low proportion of women, about 20% of women at the graduate school level, 
Um, and that stays somewhat constant, um, graduate student, postdoctoral fellow, assistant, associate, but really goes down at the full professor level. This is even lower than we would expect if we uh, take into account lag from the level of PhDs. Um, and I have other research that looks at that. In biology, you see more parity. At the graduate student level, you see approaching 50-50. Um, but still, women do lag behind, even at, at, even at the postdoctoral level, which we found interesting, and then at the assistant, associate, and full professor level as well, but still better, still considerably better than physics. Here's some gender similarities in family life for men and women. No gender differences in the hours of work reported each week. Um, we found that fascinating. No difference in work on weekends, on vacation. Scientists at these kinds of institutions all say that they work on weekends and vacations. Um, no difference in perceived support at the university level. Um, both groups were fairly critical of their universities. Um, the prototypical image of the ideal scientist when we interviewed them seemed to in some ways have a negative impact on both men and women. Women felt marginalized because um, the prototypical image of a man in science who was unencumbered did not seem to allow for their experiences. And men felt marginalized who had families because they felt like they weren't that kind of man that was, that was lauded. Um, so they felt that they experienced marginalization as well, particularly on the part of senior male colleagues. A higher proportion of women, 48%, say balancing work and family obstructed their career. More women, 45% versus 25%, say they have fewer children because of science, but, I, but still a quarter of men saying that is not small. Women experience the most difficulty having it all. As I said, nearly 25% of men, however, have fewer children because of science. And interestingly, men in both disciplines are more likely to be dissatisfied with their careers as scientists and more likely to leave science if they have fewer children than wanted than are women. And that finding really caught us, and we followed up quite a bit on that in interviews and learned that um, having fewer children, having science impinge on family life was not something that men expected. Women, on the other hand, if you're going to go into physics 20 years ago, um, you are ready to give everything you've got to it. I mean, it, it's a very different kind of cultural expectation for women than men. And so men were quite surprised um, when their scientific work really started to impinge on family life. I want to talk to you briefly about um, the marginalization of women who are mothers and some of the things that came up in our study. And then after that, turn to actually talking about tenured faculty. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. So first, um, the, when the ideal mother meets the ideal scientist. There certainly is um, mother discrimination. Uh, Joanne, assistant professor of biology, says you don't want to be too much of a mommy kind of person in this career. You know, you don't want to give off the vibe that you just want to have lots of children. I, I, how does one give off that vibe? I think everyone would frown at you and think you weren't very serious. Um, so female scientists have fewer children than their male colleagues, um, but not, not by huge proportions. You see those numbers. Um, female physicists, interestingly, of course, perhaps unsurprisingly, report less departmental support than women in biology. Um, female professors in physics report 70% report that they feel supported by the department compared to 86% in biology. They often feel more support at the departmental level than at the university level, interestingly, we find in our broader research. Um, and uh, I'm going to skip over that quote just for the sake of time. I want to talk a little bit about structural factors and cultural factors, more interpretive things. So structures, so things like department meeting times, promotion timelines, seem to preference scientists' fathers with a stay-at-home wife. Women seem to be judged more harshly when they leave early. And men and women who had children said this. Men would say to us, too, that you know, they can just get pick up at 3 o'clock to go get their children from school. And they're like thought of as being kind of a cool dad, whereas women are thought of as not being serious about their careers. Female scientists with children cannot always work the same type of hours as male colleagues. And I say type of hours because this usually came up around the issue of travel. Um, but they do report working the same number of hours. Um, the, a female professor says childcare has been hard. Then just getting everything done is challenging. And she says, I've chosen not to travel very much, about a third as much as I could. Um, I want to talk to you, too, about the cultural implications of biology. This came up from both men and women, that women are the ones, who, of course, who get pregnant, give birth, breastfeed. Um, Jill, an associate professor of physics, says 
There are those men who took the paternity leave and basically were in the office every day. It was like a sabbatical for them. At least in my experience for women, it's not physically possible for it to just be a sabbatical when you've just had a kid. For men, it is. But both men and women also say that women being pregnant rarely has an actual impact on their scientific work. But women perceive biology, perceive that being pregnant will be judged harshly and will have an impact on their scientific work. Here's some other cultural factors. Both men and women say that there's the cultural expectation that wives will care for household activities and men will act as breadwinners. And scientists' mothers expect themselves and others expect them to fulfill those roles. Let's talk a bit about tenured scientists. Um, we want to talk about tenured scientists because those are the folks supposedly who have made it, who should not be really struggling anymore. And we argue that it says something about the structure of science as a whole and about university life if they are still experiencing struggle when they're not facing the same kind of difficulties of lack of security of jobs that, say, graduate students are. A tenured scientist who have made it can tell us if it's working. I like this quote, though, from a tenured professor we call Gail in our book, Not Real Names, that the balance is not possible. I used to say, I'm in a controlled crash. And I can say now I'm in a semi-controlled crash all of the time. You just have to roll with it. I don't consider my job to be a job or a career. It's my life. I'm a physicist. I'm also a mother. And I am a wife. There are generational differences in work family struggles of academic scientists. Scientists today may actually be at the leading edge. We did some analyses compared with other professions, uh, professions with two career couples. 25% um, of scientists we interviewed are married to another scientist. And actually, a very small proportion of scientists at elite universities under the age of 50 have a full-time stay-at-home spouse, interestingly. Even for those who have made it by getting a tenure track or tenure job, both men and women must negotiate work and family. The process of achieving tenure is long and drawn out for academic scientists, delaying childbirth. So many people who have actually made it and are tenured are also negotiating very young children at that point. Long work hours, difficult travel schedules. The culture of academic science also, our respondents told us, makes it difficult for academic scientists to place a high value on family life. It requires a kind of all-consuming dedication to the profession that is perceived as negative by actually both men and women. Um, just in brief of Jill, a physicist, the very senior faculty don't have kids. Um, so when I came here, the flattering thing was they were almost immediately talking about me being chair in the next five years because they saw me as someone who'd be a good leader and a good organizer. And this was flattering. But on the other hand, it was very overwhelming because the way they have operated, I think because they don't have kids, this is very stereotypical and selfish of me. They just have poured hours and hours and hours into this job. Um, but I want to read you, too, um, a message from James, who says, when it started to having a family as a biologist while also pursuing career, he recalls saying to his wife, let's have kids. How hard can it be? You know, I forge much of my career the same way. How hard can it be? And we all know that you just keep saying that until you find out how hard it is, and then it's important to stop asking that question. Nevertheless, they waited until their career stabilized before having children. James was 40 when his first child was born, more than 15 years older than the average American man is when he has his first child. For his second child, James was 43. From the start, he recalls feeling that it was going to be important not to say to his wife, oh, you're in charge of the kids in the house, and we'll see if you get a job. He actually cited sociological studies there, uncommon. Um, yet it has been difficult. Both of them joke what they really need is a wife, a family member that could be committed full time to raising the children and maintaining the home. But because they do not have such a family member, James and his wife strive, strive to split child care equally. There are many times when I have to say, OK, you took the hit last week, taking the kid to the doctor. I'll be at home today when the kids are out of school. So what are we going to do with this information? Um, and you're kind of had to trust me, because I haven't had time to give you lots and lots of numbers. But I have them, if you want to talk more. Um, here's some things that I think we ought to think about. Scientists themselves see the need for change on the part of universities, on the part of national science bodies and funding agencies like the NIH and NSF. Um, academic partner, partner departments and individual scientists. So let's take each of these in turn. The institutional, departmental, and individual levels. The number one, we advocate for providing child care centers that are affordable to all scientists. Nearly one third of scientists surveyed said affordable university daycare is absolutely central to successfully managing work and family. 
And in our book, we actually point out which of the universities in our study do have affordable daycare on campus as a way of um, hopefully maybe holding them accountable. Childcare is not always accessible to graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, which is a major time when people drop out of science. Some universities adjust childcare center costs according to family income, but most don't. Number two, provide better non-standard childcare benefits. Backup childcare for emergencies and after hours, Rice University has this for faculty. Non-standard flex accounts for childcare. Relief from grant management responsibilities. We often get relief from teaching responsibilities when children are born, but not necessarily relief from grant management responsibilities. Um, child care that's off-site for travel. Much of science requires extensive travel to conferences and international collaboration. Child care becomes extremely dicey in those kinds of situations. Make leaves and stopping tenure clocks, this is a controversial one, automatic for both men and women. Leave policies are sometimes different for graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. And we suggest that universities actually offer leaves for graduate students and postdoctoral fellows as well and offer automatic one paid semester leaves for all rank of scientists. The new parent, we argue in our book, should have to um, apply to forego leave rather than to take leave, which has a lot of cultural implications and we think would actually change the culture around how leaves are done, as well as a mandatory halt of the tenure clock that one would have to apply to forego rather than to take. At the departmental level, um, which is often the real home of the scientists, um, we advocate developing checks and balances um, for especially department chairs. Local departmental cultures have power. Child care leave can be available to you, but you can be made to feel horrible for taking it by those of your department. So departmental cultures have an incredible amount of power. So what would it mean, what would it look like to have checks and balances on those departments? Departments need to help scientists' parents cope with the departmental responsibilities during intense child-rearing times. Um, and there needs to be conscious, sustained effort by departmental leaders. We should also say it's not all bad. There were some amazing, amazing departments and department leaders, often men, that came up in our study who were extremely aware of these matters. There's one department, I won't name it because the departments are confidential, but um, that had an just amazing gender equity in, in a physics department. And this, the department chair was incredibly intentional um, and had a narrative that we talk about in our book um, for how to be intentional. At the individual level, how can we empower individuals to change cultures? How can we stop telling stories about how children are always an impediment to scientific work and start talking about the conditions under which they might actually enhance and make more robust and meaningful scientific work? Most powerful, how can we change the conversation surrounding tension between work and family, balance between work and family from a woman's issue to a family issue or an issue that influences both men and women? Thank you. Here's some more articles. Do I have a 30 seconds? I have 30 seconds. Yeah. Here's the book. Actually, the editor just changed the title yesterday. This was not my title, but this is the title. Those of you who have written books, you know those editors get final say. I hope you like it. Said the Beyond the Ideal Scientist, Why uh, Academic Scientist Doesn't Work for Men and Women Who Have Children, Why It Matches. It's too long and too negative, too negative. So um, it's now called Failing Families, Failing Science, Work Family Conflict in Academic Science. It's OK. I like it. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, let's go. No, on the uh, previous slide. Okay. Put, the, put your sights up. Oh, okay. Leave those up. Thanks. Yeah, that's right. Sure. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to open it for questions. I, oh, we uh, should stand up here, right? Oh, we'll, we'll get you up as we need. So if anyone uh, would like to start with a question, I can bring the mic up to you and you can ask the question directly. Um, yeah, I have a question for Aaron on drawing out the passion principle. I believe there are a lot of people out there whose passion is money. <laughs> and so what do you do with someone like that? If they pick uh, places their first criterion, money or fame or power, aren't they just following their passion? 
That's a great question. What are good and bad passions? Right, what are good and bad And the, the thing that was interesting is um, I asked students about this often very explicitly. Uh, and they were quite agnostic about what could count as an appropriate passion. So there wasn't a sense that some fields were uh, more appropriate to feel passion towards than others. And so people could say, if they're passionate about having a lot of money and they really like great cars and they like having a good house, that that was a legitimate reason if they were passionate about it. But it couldn't just be that I want to make sure that I am um, you know, living in the right neighborhood and go into this field because it happens to have a lot of money. I can just project without They're also taping. So, okay, okay. All right. So my question is also for you, Aaron, and forgive me if it's if I'm missing a point, but I'm curious if if you're also arguing that the passion principle is itself a mechanism of inequality in the following way, which is that um, by emphasizing that people have the inability to know what they're passionate about. For that example, people have the ability or inability? Inability to know what they're passionate about. Because it seems like it might be much easier to find a secure pathway in life in terms of your career choices if you did focus on something practical versus trying to figure out what you're passionate about. And then a second mechanism in that is that there would be a class effect in the sense, and maybe this is a question, that people from more advantaged backgrounds have a better capacity because of cultural capital, um, largely through their preferences, for expressing what it is that they're passionate about. So would you say that the passion principle itself is something that's sort of a noose that people can hang themselves by? And is it more challenging by class to identify what one is passionate about? Interesting. Um, I'll take the latter question. So I, I, I don't know that it's more difficult, but certainly people who are advantaged socioeconomically probably have a variety, a, a greater variety of things that they are exposed to uh, that they might identify as their passion than, uh, than lower income or first generation students. So, um, and this is something I'm interested in exploring further with my data analysis with these data as well as uh, in other data, is to try and understand whether the uh, generally pretty robust finding that uh, lower income students are more likely to um, go after science and engineering majors than other fields, it has to do with the fact that there is more consistent teaching of science and engineering fields in, um, in K-12 education than there is teaching of philosophy or sociology or psychology, right? Um, so that there's that exposure question. Um, and I don't know that I would necessarily say that people are or are not able to identify their passion or it's a sort of a false consciousness statement, and, and perhaps that's the direction you're going, but um, regardless of how they come to find their passion, that this certainly can serve as a mechanism for reproducing equality, in part because the ability to find jobs in the thing that you end up being passionate about uh, is, is different by class. Hi. Uh, I'm actually asking this question on behalf of uh, my colleague Leslie, who had to leave to pick up her child, uh, ironically, in light of the talk. Um, but it's interesting. So we were uh, ch chatting here while Erin uh, was giving her talk, and I was curious about. Um, there's a recent book by William Der Dershowitz, Dershowitz, I can't exactly pronounce his name, called Excellent Cheap, uh, that basically argues that um, students are not doing exactly what you say they're doing. What they're really doing is trying to succeed. I don't know what that means. You know, it's, uh, I've seen it in my students too. It's sort of the attitude of, uh, I need to win a Nobel Prize and it doesn't matter in what. Right? I just need to win a Nobel Prize. And so I'm wondering uh, how your research integrates with the, those apparent findings from other scholars. Yeah, that's a great question. So one thing that I didn't have time to talk about today was the sort of nuances of how these cultural schemas work. So um, I don't fully believe that they don't take monetary and employment related considerations into account. I just don't. I think that that's something that creeps in. It might creep in into whether they think you're passionate about something um, rather than something else. Uh, but it's the salience of this passion and the fact that it seems overdetermined. That if you have a student who's saying, I don't really know what I want my major to be. What should I do? 
their friends, their professors, the career counselor is going to tell them to follow their passion. And so um, for that sense, I think there's an issue of wanting to succeed, particularly at institutions like Rice, where we expect students to go on and do great things. I think that's a little bit different at other types of institutions. Um, so I want to make clear that I, I do believe that that's going on. It's just not the dominant cultural narrative that's out there. Elaine, you, you talked about uh, science, uh, but you didn't distinguish between social science and, and physical science. Would you expect the, since you chose two physical sciences, would you expect these results to be similar in the social sciences? Well, one of the, the reasons that we chose, so there are characteristics of the social sciences that mirror some of these sciences, right? So there are different social sciences that have different proportions of men and women. So one of the reasons, as I said, that we chose biology and physics is because of the different proportions. There's sort of some kind of tipping point where having a certain number of women, either at the institutional level, say, or at the local level in a department kind of helps things. We found that that does seem to make a difference. Um, it is uh, uh, like sort of an initial necessary condition, but not necessarily a sufficient condition to really um, get at issues of inequality and in gender, which has spillover into family life kinds of issues too. So we might expect um, that, say, sociology, which has a much higher proportion of women than economics, um, might do better um, in these kinds of uh, work-family balance kinds of issues. But at the local level, and to, if we look among sociology departments, there's a good deal of difference. So local cultures seem to matter a lot. Is, is uh, likewise with engineering, uh, science and engineering are similar, but they're not exactly the same. Would you imagine your results would be the same for engineering and science? There is an interesting set of work that's just coming out, and Erin, maybe you can help me. I can't remember the author of this work who argues that, say, um, physics and philosophy does very poorly as well um, in attracting and retaining women and is very concerned about that, that um, recent scholars have argued that these disciplines and field are seen as being very high on the brilliance possibility. Um, so women are much more likely as um, being, you know, seen to be able to do collaborative work, work that involves life or work that involves people, and that actual stereotypes about the nature of the discipline and what it means to succeed in that discipline affect issues of inequality. Now, who does that work? I don't know, but it was in the Proceedings of National Academy of Science. It, yes, it was in the Proceedings of the Na and this last year, right? Mm -hmm. It was in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. So this author was trying to argue, you know, what's similar about physics and philosophy, right? Like we have a, hum a humanities discipline here, which is also struggling. And the authors were arguing this is this brilliance principle. Regardless of whether or not that's true, there is the perception. You know, this is where perceptions become very operative. Time for one more question, and then uh, I think we'll, what I'll do is invite everyone out to continue the discussion. Uh, so, Hi, um, my question is for Erin. Um, I actually work in the Office of Academic Advising here, um, and my colleagues in the Center for Career Development here and, and I, um, when we're talking to students who are trying to decide on a major, who are still exploring their academic opportunities here at Rice, um, one of the points that we strongly uh, try to convey to them is that the major that they choose to pursue here at Rice doesn't necessarily equate to the type of job or career that they might find uh, after graduation, but that by pursuing their passion, they. Um, you know, it gives them the opportunity to develop uh, very transferable skills um, through, you know, ex following their curiosity and, and, and something that, that they want to explore really deeply. 
And so, um, you know, a student that majors in the arts may not become a starving artist or, or an English major may not be a, a aspiring writer that's, you know, struggling to get by, but they may, in fact, find careers in, you know, in Houston, you know, they may, they may be able to find work at an oil or gas company or things like that that may provide greater financial security. So, um, it, in light of that advice, I guess, you know, if that actually plays out in, in, in the real world, so to speak. Um, I guess what thoughts do you have about, about that and um, the passion principle um, uh, perpetuating I inequality? Yeah, great question. Thank you for um, sharing your perspective on that. Um, so I think at the individual level, passion is a, probably a fairly good thing to tell students at least think about. Um, also to make sure that there aren't other considerations like um, you know, whether they can find a job and whether this is something that they can use to pay off student loans. And, and of course you're right that uh, what you major in does not limit completely the kinds of things you can go into, although it does limit the range of things you can go into. So if you come out with a sociology degree, you can't go out and get an engineering job often, right? It's, uh, so it does limit you in particular ways. So this, it, it, it's difficult because what you're doing as focus is, is uh, working with students on an individual level, but what I'm pointing to is a, is a broader structural problem, and, uh, that, and changing it at the structural level has to do with access to higher education, the ability to pay off student loans, um, access to uh, the labor market that doesn't rely on sort of the networking processes that we know happen uh, to, in order to get a job. And so uh, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say change the way that you're doing it by any means, um, but, but uh, maybe add in there a reflection or a ask students to reflect upon other considerations like uh, job opportunities and employment uh, concerns and, and monetary concerns and have those as a morally legitimate thing that they can consider. Thank you. I hope you could uh, join me in uh, thanking both of our speakers today.